I'd also like to extend a welcome and say good morning to you and thank Anthony for that extraordinarily moving contribution, which uh, is very, very hard for me to follow as a, as a paediatrician, but thank you, Anthony. Glenn asked me this year to talk a little bit about data, which I'm particularly, you'll see at the end, I have a particular interest in. But I want to start by saying, echoing something else he mentioned, which was when I was invited uh, by, by Philip Hunt, Lord Philip Hunt is chair of, at the time, GS1 uh, advisory board. I kind of give a challenge. Glenn came to see me and people were talking to me, and I was conscious as a very busy clinician that we have people all of the time kind of telling us, giving us the hard sell what to do. And we've been asked over my professional lifetime to be to have evidence-based practice, evidence-based medicine. So I kind of said to Glenn, well, people aren't just going to believe this because you tell them it's true. Even you're a non-for-profit organization, people are going to think, what's the hidden agenda here? What you've got to do is go out and find some evidence and data that will convince people. And Glenn mentioned some of that, and there's the tech talks tomorrow, which will expand on that. So I think that's been a huge change, even in a short time, and, I, and a tribute to GS1 for rising to that challenge. And with people in... Uh, Derby, Cornwall, North Tees, all around the country getting that happening. Um, previously, I've talked about my own patient safety journey, but today I want to talk about data. Um, when you want to convince clinicians to do things differently, you need to take them with you. And I think today we're going to have both Derek Alderson and Bob Goddard here, presidents of two of the largest medical royal colleges in the United Kingdom. So I think that's evidence that clinicians are starting to buy into this story. So I want to take you back. Uh, uh, one of the few times in my life where I showed any prescience whatsoever was actually in 1979, in the middle of my studies at university to be a doctor, I took a year out to go to the Department of Electrical Engineering at Imperial College. And the reason I did that was that I, I thought that computing and data in 1979 would have a huge impact on medicine. And I wanted to become more conversant with it. Now, this is the state of data in 1979. That is an IBM computer, a mainframe computer. As a student, you had to book time on the computer. You had to program it yourself using, that's one of my own Fortran punch cards. You have to learn Fortran and then program it. And you would go on in your allotted time. You would have a set time and try and produce something. Um, uh, the chairman of IBM said in 1944, I think, there would be a maximum uh, market in the world for five computers. And th this was probably one of five in the UK in 1970. So an extraordinary change. Within uh, five, six years of, of my one year at Imperial College, I had my first Apple Macintosh laptop. That was the exponential change. And that has continued. So where are we now, uh, 40 years on in my career, we are absolutely uh, awash with data, and the challenge is how to use it. So this is um, Edwards Deming. I think he, he was the person who first put forward the idea of Six Sigma Lean uh, production that Toyota took on board. But he said, as, as on the front of a US $10 bill, in God we trust, but everyone else can bring data. And that was kind of my challenge to you, Glenn. So we are surrounded by, by data, cancer registries, 800,000 children a year in the UK having about 13 different immunizations, all our own email, professional and personal. The 100,000 people in the UK now have had their genome sequenced. Each MRI scan, 150 megabytes, and electronic health records, which I'll come back to. And these figures are truly astonishing. By 2020, the average UK hospital will generate 1,000 terabytes a year of data. A terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. So this is a million gigabytes. What I think is far more striking than that is the second statistic. The third one is that 90% of the world's data today was generated in the last two years. So that is quite, that shows that exponential rise that I started in 1979. That is continuing. Okay. Well, what will we use these data for? Well, I personally use them for, uh, to do research on children's disease, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But we will also use them to support people managing their own health through telemedicine, which I'll say a little bit about. And it will support providers, which is part of the journey. I'm, I'm a clinician, but surely a big part of the use of data and the role of GS1 is in inventories and procurement 
The, the back office staff that is absolutely crucial for us as doctors and nurses and pharmacists to do our job. But of course, we are awash with data, but we're still, certainly in the health service, very dependent on manual data entry. A lot of the data I use in my research is entered by, by clerical workers, by people taking an old-fashioned file, paper record, handwritten, in bad handwriting, and trying to decipher and come up with, for example, ICD codes for diagnosis. And GS1 and techniques like that have a huge capacity to allow us to speed up data entry, as Glenn mentioned, saving a doctor and nurse and clerical time. Not surprising that data is already changing our practice clinicians. In some areas of practice, I think this is a little bit overstated and a danger of overpromising and underdelivering. For things like imaging, so this is an optical coherence tomogram. This is a, a, a scan of the back of the eye. Moorfields Hospital does about 1,000 a day. Each one has 63 million data points in it, and it has 10 times the resolution of an MRI scan. It's phenomenal technology. And why would we be surprised that if you let a large computer use machine learning to, to come up with an algorithm for pattern recognition, why would we be surprised that that's more accurate and faster than a doctor? an ophthalmologist. That doesn't mean we're going to be doing away with doctors or nurses anytime soon, but it does mean that data is going to be increasingly part of our lives for things like algorithms. Pattern recognition, whether it's ECGs, is a, is a mole, a benign nevus or a malignant melanoma, is a scan of the back of your eye abnormal. For sure it's going to make a difference there. And this is from a conference I was at last year, actually in the Middle East, but again I said I would talk about telemedicine. I think Kaiser Permanente in California have, I think, 13 million patients. They kind of manage in an integrated way from cradle to grave. Eight million of those 13 million, they principally manage uh, uh, at a distance. They will see them face to face if they need to, but an awful lot of the interactions done through email, Skype, telephone, digital patients uploading their own data. So where will we be in 2039? Well, this is slightly hazardous, uh, predicting the future. I already told you about the IBM chairman, how badly wrong he got it in 1944. Uh, there's going to be a lot of drivers that change the practice of medicine over the next 20 years. And I don't have time to talk about the, the demographic changes in age and the population, and indeed the, the different diseases that we'll be seeing. You heard of about those three terrifying infections that affected Anthony. But in my own lifetime, we've had Ebola, SARS, MERV, HIV, diseases that I didn't even learn about when I was at medical school. But what is going to make a huge change are these changes in technology. And uh, uh, I've mentioned artificial intelligence, robotics, online medicine, telemedicine, and data. This is an article I wrote in the BMJ, I think in 2013. And I wrote it at the behest in credit to him of the previous Secretary of State, Jeremy Hunt, I was talking to him about the frustrations of trying to use data and, and uh, computing in my everyday clinical practice. And I contrasted it with my own personal experience of, of my iPhone, of, of booking flights, train tickets, uh, running my diary, everything very intuitive. And I described to him my average morning, which felt like computer said no, ward round, Handover starting at 8.30, all done with paper. If we tried to do it, we did have a computer in the room and a screen, but it was so clunky, it was just too slow. So it was fast to do it by paper. And then going on the ward, wanting to look at the patient's x-ray, that was one system with one password and one uh, username. You look at the x-ray, you come out, then you log into the electronic prescribing record, different login number, name, different password. While you're in there, you think, I don't quite remember the dose of this drug. Does that system help you? No. You have to log out of that system and log into the eBNF online, find out the drug dose, and then here's the really crazy bit. Then write that drug dose down on a piece of paper with a pen, which is where all the errors creep in, all the decimal point errors. Then you log back into the electronic prescribing system and you transcribe what you've written by pen back into the computer. I told him this. He said he couldn't, in a sense, couldn't believe it, but also he said, you've got to write that out. And I wrote it up as a sort of uh, Star Trek, you know, a, a log of, of an average ward round. And it was published. So it was a fairly 
not cynical, but skeptical view in 2013, I have to say I'm much more optimistic. In the last week, the last week, um, I work at University College Hospital, we're at Orm Street Hospital. They're both moving on to a system called EPIC. It has been EPIC, I can tell you. EPIC is an a comprehensive integrated electronic patient record. In truth, uh, UCLH, fantastic amount of, of training. Marcel Levy, the chief executive, had walked this walk at, in Amsterdam, so he'd been there before. 5 a.m. on a morning, a whole hospital with 1,300 patients and 10,000 staff moves over like this to a completely paperless system. Extraordinary moment. I have to say, between 8.30 and 9.30, it crashed five times. <laughs> but then it didn't. And then that kind of, all the cynics would say, oh, I told you so, a disaster. But after that, it didn't ever crash again. And it was extraordinary that all of those things I told you, there's a single log on, and then we had the patient's records, their blood test results, their x-rays, electronic prescribing, in-house guidelines, everything in one place. Now, that system is designed to be, it is GS1 compliant in the sense it can generate uh, stickers and wristbands. It doesn't yet have the software to allow the GS1 data to be incorporated, but the plan is that it should. And I think that's what's really exciting. And the NHS is mandated by 2020 to be GS1 compliant. And those things that Glenn talked about, uh, the e-observations, the, the ability to take EPIC and make it even more powerful by rapid data entry and error-free data entry, you take out the person with the pen and the paper and you're scanning person, product, and place, which is what I recommended when I did the review for the MHRA. That is got to be the way forward. And you know, we've already had that in, um, in blood transfusion for quite a long time. And it's had a huge effect on reducing uh, blood transfusion errors and fatal reactions to the wrong blood. So uh, the, the path of the journey of, of barcoding and uh, unique identifiers has been well trodden. I want to finish by just saying a little bit about how it might be used for research. So um, Glenn mentioned unwarranted variation, which is something that's a problem not just of the NHS, but of all healthcare systems I'm familiar with. I got interested in this when in 2011, the NHS published what was called an atlas of variation. It was a very candid document. Along the bottom, do you remember those things we had called primary care trusts? Which have gone now, but there were 152 in England. And this is a, a graph of, if you like, the performance of each of those primary care trusts for children with type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is an entirely treatable condition. It's not difficult to diagnose. And once treated, well, in the NHS, treatment's free at the point of delivery, but it's treated with insulin, which we've known about since the 1920s. It's not expensive. Everybody can have it. The only potential fatal complication of type 1 diabetes in childhood is a thing called diabetic ketoacidosis. The child goes into a coma because of lack of insulin and high blood sugar. The details don't matter. This is the percentage of children in each of those primary care trusts who've been admitted with in coma in the last five years. And there is an extraordinary variation. This is within one country. This is not comparing England to Sweden or anywhere else. This is within one country where all care is free at the point of delivery in a disease that's easily diagnosed and is treatable. So in the worst performing primary care trust, about 46% of their children with diabetes had been admitted in coma in the last five years. And in the best performing, it's about 7%. So I was absolutely fascinated by this. And to cut a long story short, it's five years of research. It's several, I just want to show you the power of data. There was a national audit where every, all 25,000 young people with type 1 diabetes a year have had their data collected for the last 10 years, so a huge data set that you can then study. And for the first time, we were able to show two factors that play a part in that variation. It wasn't down to money spent by, by primary care trust. It actually wasn't down to number of doctors or nurses employed in the diabetes service. Um, two factors we did find. The first is partly seems to be due to, not due to, associated with ethnicity. So um, if you don't have diabetes in this audience, your HbA1c, which is a measure of your blood sugar level, your how well controlled you are, would be around 40, that false origin at the bottom. We're all around, hopefully, around 40. If you have type 1 diabetes, you would be aiming to, to have a level of about 60. That would be good control. And you, first of all, you can see that in, the, in England, most children are well above 60, so that's, that's a separate point. But you can see that children who self-declare themselves as of black ethnicity 
have higher HbA1c's than white children. It's the first thing. The second thing is that within each of those ethnic groups, I've d divided them by, by quintiles of, of poverty or deprivation. So the most deprived children or their parents are the white columns at the right-hand side, and the uh, most affluent families are the darker columns at the left-hand side. You can see that for every ethnic group, there's a gradient where the more wealthy your family are, although the treatment's free, these aren't people being treated privately, the more affluent or perhaps better educated, or better at navigating the healthcare system, one of those reasons your, your blood glucose control will be better. And indeed, sadly, if you look at the two green arrows, the child of the most affluent black family only do as well as the children of the poorest white family. So the power of data to help us understand these things is incredibly powerful. But all of those data were hand-entered. 25,000 people a year, each child seen probably four times a year in clinic with multiple measurements, 10 years of data, all entered by hand. A lot of scope for error there. Think of the power of entering all of that as people, person, product, place, <coughs> insulin dose, uh, BMI, everything entered using uh, uh, automatic or rapid data entry using something like GS1 barcodes. So to finish, um, Eric Topol was invited by Jeremy Hunt before he, he t finished his time at the Department of Health and Social Care to do a wide-ranging review of the impact, the potential for using technology and data to help improve the performance of the NHS. He said something I, I don't agree with. Eric Topol said that he thought that uh, routine care will no longer need a doctor or a nurse. I don't buy that for a moment. That's a separate talk. I've said that for some things particularly pattern recognition and images, it will have a profound effect. But all of us, when we're ill, as I'm sure Anthony would testify to, when we're low and ill, we actually want someone to talk to and explain our problems to. Uh, would, you trust, would you trust talking to a computer or a telephone that said, if you're feeling low, press three. If you're very low, four. <laughs> if you're desperately low, press five. And then it says, I didn't quite get that. Could you just repeat that? <laughs> I don't think it's happening anytime soon, frankly. I think where it will help, and I've tried to emphasize this, and it really builds on what Glenn said, is that in this what can be called drudgery, we have a, a real workforce crisis, which Brexit will certainly exacerbate. 15% uh, of the doctors working in the NHS today come from EU countries. Uh, even more nurses, even more care workers. So, Leave that aside even worldwide, the WHO has estimated a huge shortfall of, of caring professionals. Artificial intelligence, robotics, GS1 data entry can really, really remove a lot of that drudgery, which frees up the time of people like me, practicing doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, to do after all what we're trained to do. We're not, you know, we're not being paid to enter data into a system. We can spend time with people, talking to them, hearing about their woes. And so I think this kind of what I'd call drudgery or the, the back office stuff can be hugely, as places like Derby have showed, have been hugely improved by using GS1 for data entry. Thank you very much. <laughs>